seeing a uh, transparent podium reminds me of a fundraiser I was at one time with Ann Richards, who had been the governor of Texas. She was the honoree of the dinner, came up to a podium like this and said, if I'd realized you all could see my legs, I would have brought a better pair. That's all I got. <laughs> so you've heard some really wonderful thoughts, reasons why church, but perhaps some of you are like me, when the harder question isn't why church, I've got good answers. The harder question is how church? And I'd like to spend a few minutes exploring that with you, but recognize that I am one person with one person's set of experiences. Um, and this is not a template for anyone else necessarily, but a hope that perhaps in our conversation you'll find some ideas that can be useful to you as you think about how church. In other places I've shared uh, some of uh, my journey with regard to the church or perhaps overshared it. Um, as, a, as a newly out gay man, I stepped away from the church for a couple of decades. Um, I couldn't see an answer for myself in that period of how church. Uh, and at one time I described that as having taken a rather long vacation from church. And my, one of my brothers was present and said, I think a better description would be absent without leave. Potato, potato, right? Um, anyway, over time, uh, as goals were achieved and the, the enjoyments of life realized, I, I recognized that I wanted to invest more effort into my spiritual life. And it was a point in life where uh, I felt that if I made a decision to return to church, it was my choice, not for anyone else's purposes, and that I would bring to it my own understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. My friend Megan Decker has said that when we are at turning points in our lives, we can resolve to always turn toward Jesus. And at the time, I might not have identified this as a turning point, my desire to draw closer to Christ. It turned out to be one, of course, but the thing about turning points is that they often bring along with them additional challenges and needs for more turning. So my first answer when I was considering whether I could re-engage with the church was to sneak into sacrament meetings already in progress and head out as soon as amen was uttered uh, so that it wasn't a social experience, but it was an opportunity for me to see how I would feel, what I would connect in terms of messages given and feelings of the spirit. COVID for me was much the same thing, that, that sort of very solitary inward journey. It also eliminated my personal standards of dress and grooming. Uh, perhaps some of you can relate to that one as well. Um, COVID was followed by a temporary move into another ward where my experience with church was more outwardly social, but less tethered, where I felt more of should and less of would. Over the past 15 years, I've found that, that when my heart and mind and soul are fed in a spirit of loving association in a congregation, my ward is the church. Conversely, when I don't feel connected in that congregation, the church is that distant administrative behemoth that is largely unrelated to my personal spiritual journey. I moved into a, a new ward about a year and a half ago, a rather different ward, maybe a better description is quirky. Are any of you familiar with the Hulu series Schitt's Creek? Okay. Could you show the slide of that for me, please? Um, so for those of you who uh, may be unfamiliar, it concerns a, a wealthy, dysfunctional family in Beverly Hills whose business manager has now stolen all their money. The only thing they have left is what had been a gag birthday gift years earlier, the ownership of a motel in a small town called Schitt's Creek. 
the, the family decamps to this little town, and over the course of six seasons, uh, we come to know not only the idiosyncrasies of the family members, but also the quirks of all the people in the town. Over those seasons, we laugh a lot, but our hearts are touched because we come to see the goodness in each person. So when I say to you that I moved into the Schitt's Creek Ward, I want you to hear that both in the sense of some unorthodox practices maybe, but also in the goodness of the hearts of the people. Let me give you a few examples. So uh, uh, first time attending Elders Quorum, that question I expect and dread, uh, oh, are you related to Elder Christopherson? And I said, yes, his sister-in-law is married to my brother. I'm glad at least some of you got that, by the way. Uh, in that Elders Quorum, it was blank stares. And I thought, OK, a smart aleck is not the right way to approach these people. Um, I learned in attending that the first Sunday in this ward perhaps ought to be called Fast and TMI meeting. Um, we, uh, I should in fairness say, most of the TMIs were visitors, but anyway. Uh, one unique cultural aspect of it that surprised me was when a person would begin their address in sacrament meeting and say, good morning, the congregation responded, good morning. Now, I've done aloha before, but good morning was a little odd. And I thought, well, this is kind of strange. Over time, I came to hear the love and support that were implicit in those words. I'm nervous, and when I say to you, good morning, you lovingly respond, good morning. I'm here for you. Um, during an adult Sunday school class, one sister clapped her hand over the mouth of another sister just as she was going to make a comment. <clears throat> I think my eyes might have gotten a little wide. And the first sister said to me, it's OK, she's my aunt. <laughs> We're a little quirky. Now, in fairness, I would have to tell you that they've also had to get used to some aspects of unorthodox me. When I was teaching a Sunday school class and referred to um, something that I had recently seen on The Chosen and said, you know, I, I can't always remember who each apostle is, except Matthew, of course, on the spectrum, and Simon Peter, because he's hot and wears short dresses. And, um, uh, am I right? I mean, those muscles, the shorts, whatever. Um, the bishop did mention that to me a week later. Uh, he said, uh, I'm going to have to watch more closely. I didn't realize Simon was hot. Now, when I stopped focusing on the oddities, I did notice a few other things. One is that participation in a class or a quorum isn't a contest of opinions. What I realized is that each person could share what was on their heart, and no one felt the need to either negate it or to proclaim it, but simply to appreciate the goodness of someone willing to share their thoughts. <clears throat> I've also been touched by the generosity of those with little. There is an older couple in the ward who goes around to three different Einstein bagels every night to pick up their day-old bagels. They take those bagels to three different churches who have food banks, and then on Sunday morning, they bring bagels into our ward so that everyone in the ward has something they can enjoy for breakfast every day. Having enough to, to eat, to be able to pay rent, have transportation to a job, that is the focus of ministering efforts in the ward, and really in the genuine care that members evidence for each other. It's a ward where missionaries find 
uh, ongoing success because anyone they bring is welcome. I think uh, particularly of a, a young man who's been joining us for the past couple of months, Jacob, who wears a t-shirt and shorts, has worn that every week for seven or eight weeks. Another brother wears uh, nicely clean pressed jeans and a, and a white shirt. And it is a reminder to me that the Lord looketh upon the heart. More recently, last week, a <clears throat> uh, fairly recent convert uh, and his wife, older couple, uh, he is now a priest in the Iranian priesthood and blesses the sacrament for us each week in a very deep and gravelly voice. This past Sunday, he repeated the, the words, can stumble over the words, and repeated the prayer four times before he was able to complete it. <clears throat> but that meant hearing that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of thy son. which was shed for them <clears throat> four separate times. I've had a recent experience of what happens when blood doesn't flow. And it reminded me that the Savior's shedding of blood in our behalf never loses its efficacy. That as we remember the effect of his atoning sacrifice is renewed in us. There's a commitment to Christ in every message and action, but it's not a philosophy, it's an experience. A brother came to bear his testimony and had to be helped to the podium, could only stand for a moment and then sat in a chair on the stand and with a microphone. He's a Vietnam veteran with suffering the effects of Agent Orange. And his witness was that a loving, Heavenly Parent had led missionaries to his door 15 years earlier so that knowing that he would reach a point where what allowed him to continue was the love and care and support of the other members of his ward. He was followed by several other members who talked about the goodness that he had brought into the ward over these years and their gratitude as well that missionaries had found him to bring him into our family. So perhaps it seems like when I say how church, what I'm saying is go find a great ward of humble disciples. <clears throat> or you can call me when you're in Phoenix and um, I'll introduce you to what I no longer call the Schitt's Creek Ward, but now call the Zion Ward of the Phoenix East Stake. My larger point is about how church, it means more how I see and seek Christ in a congregation and less about how I'm welcome. Seeing more deeply into the soul of another is a gift of the Lord's to be able, not that they have shed layers so that we see them more clearly, but that gift of being able to see what he so dearly loves about each one, which means the shedding of lenses in my own vision of filters. How church feels differently to me now, rather than as a primarily personal spiritual effort, it's a reminder that in a congregation with fairly few nuclear families, association is the essence of heaven. The meaning I find in restoration in the temple is binding the family of our heavenly parents, where each of us has a place an honored place. I sense that our connections to one another as siblings in that eternal family will be rich and deep and verdant. The idea of those relationships seems sweeter to me and more abundant than to rule and reign. Claiming my place in the body of Christ now seems a willingness to receive the gifts that others bring to that body. How church has come to mean engaging in a regular practice of giving and receiving mercy. I've experienced in my life 
the effulgent mercy of Jesus Christ. My certainty is that his grace, his atoning sacrifice, will always be available to you and to me and to everyone we love. That we can always turn to him, the literal meaning of repentance. What I've tasted of the goodness of the Father of all mercies directs me toward a belief that eternity means progression, that the joy of serving and living with heavenly parents and Savior will be available to all willing to receive it through whatever additional learning and growing and healing processes are yet in store. Where can I live outside myself? Where can I live in Christ among others who are also trying to be like him? That is how church to me. It is also how family, how community, how peace. My prayer for each one of us and for all those whose lives connect to ours is that whether how church takes place in a temple, a chapel, a mountain, a beach, a conversation in Starbucks, or any place else, I pray that because we have known the love of Christ, we will be given his gift of sharing it with every sibling of his family that we can reach, that we may be useful to him in accomplishing his work and his glory, that we may be his friends. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.